going to turn the session over to Julie Burnath and Yuna Han, um, who will in introduce um, the panelists for this first plenary roundtable. Thank you very much, Kurt. We are um, very grateful to uh, all the conference organizers for the opportunity to start with this round, round table on the theme of accountability in the absence of multilateralism, experiences and lessons for the future from Syria. Uh, my name is Julie Bernat. I'm a senior researcher with the Swiss Peace Research Institute and the University of Basel. And I'm also uh, co-chair of the Standing Group on Human Rights and Transition Justice uh, of the European Consortium for Political Research, which is one of the co-sponsors of this uh, joint human rights conference. And today this roundtable uh, is organized together with um, Yuna Han. Uh, Yuna is a fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science uh, in the Department of International Relations, and she will take over the facilitation for the roundtable uh, in the second part. Um, so earlier this year, March 2021, has marked the 10th year since the uprising in Syria, which escalated into a brutal war. And in these 10 years, virtually every imaginable international crime has been not only committed in Syria, but also documented. However, this stands in stark contrast to the continued impunity in the country uh, and the failure of those institutions established as part of the post-Cold War architecture of international criminal justice to address demands for accountability in the context of blockages at the UN Security Council. This complex and difficult situation, however, has also led to creativity and the emergence of new types of actors and initiatives uh, pushing for accountability, which extend the system and reach of international criminal law and also arguably um, are changing the landscape of international criminal justice today. And these kinds of creative workarounds in the context of geopolitical impasses uh, may become increasingly more central to responses to mass atrocities, given broader changes to the power dynamics in the global order. In order to discuss these issues, we have uh, wonderful speakers with us today, whom I would like to warmly welcome and introduce, also on behalf of my colleagues, Yuna. So first, uh, we have Noura Razi, who is joining us from Beirut today. Noura is a human rights lawyer and currently also a fellow at TIMEP, the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Uh, she is also the founder and ex executive director of No Photo Zone, which is an organization based in Beirut, uh, providing legal assistance, empowerment, and advocacy for detainees and their families, as well as families of those forcibly disappeared in Syria. Second, we have Melinda Rankin, whom I uh, extend special thanks to because I believe she's had the most uh, challenging time zone to join us from, uh, if she's actually currently based in, in Australia. Uh, Melinda is an honorary research fellow at the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. And most recently, her research uh, is examining practices and innovations in international criminal law when both international and local options for criminal accountability fail, including in the Syrian context, uh, which will be published as a book with the Cambridge University Press uh, with the title, De Facto International Prosecutors in a Global Area. And finally, uh, we hope that our third speaker will join us soon. He uh, is dealing unfortunately with some family issues, but will be joining us as soon as possible. And that is Ibrahim Ulabi. Ibrahim is the founder and executive director of the Syrian Legal Development Program, an organization providing legal training and expertise to Syrian NGOs on various legal issues pertaining to forced dis displacement, torture, or UN mechanisms, for instance. He's also a barrister in the UK and is working with Guernica 37 International Justice Chambers. We'll proceed as follows for this uh, roundtable. We will first have a very short uh, round of inputs from the speakers, and we encourage the audience to already start asking questions in the Q&A uh, function of, of this online platform. And Yuna will collect them already for the second round of inputs from our speakers, and later, if we do have time, a Q&A session. Um, right, so without further ado, 
um, I would like to give the, sport, the floor to our uh, first speaker, in this case, uh, Melinda, over to you. Thank you. It's an enormous pleasure to be on this virtual panel. And um, thank you so much, Yuna and Julie, for organising this. Um, so I'm just going to touch on two main points um, in relation to the topic. Uh, the first is the role of non-state actors, and the second is the role of German universal jurisdiction in Syrian accountability. And I'll conclude briefly with a summary of some of the lessons learned from Syria on the future of international criminal justice. Um, I know that Ibrahim and, and Nira will talk about a little about the about the role of torture um, in international criminal law, but just briefly, um, the first responsibility, and I know torture is a, a crime of choice um, referred to under the Syrian government, um, but the first responsibility for closing the accountability, the accountability gap for, um, for the Convention Against Torture is local Syrian police and judiciary, um, particularly for crime which, of torture, which is a unique crime. It's considered a just cogens of international law, um, and this like, notion with ergonomous obligations from the state parties. Um, Syria is a, stop, a state party of the Convention Against Torture, and Syria's constitution explicitly prohibits the use of torture. So with that just as a background, um, my argument there starts with the role of private non-state actors, including witnesses and victims of core crimes uh, perpetrated in Syria as having played an important practical role in closing the accountability gap and have become what I describe as de facto international prosecutors. Um, de facto international prosecutors are private non-state actors and state legal officials in the foreign courts who adopt the practices of the offices of international prosecutors. Um, these practices include collecting linkage materials, such as documents produced by the perpetrator that link those most responsible with the underlying crimes, which follows a Nuremberg model. Um, they record witness and victim statements. They write private complaints, um, which they submit to criminal courts, and they prepare or they prepare case briefs. They do so when the local efforts for criminal accountability for core crimes fail or the International Criminal Tribunal is not available. In the Syrian context, I'd like to highlight two groups. Uh, there's many, many groups um, that have been key to criminal accountability in relation to Syria. Uh, the two that I, I will look at here is the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, otherwise known as CJA, um, and the other group is the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights. Uh, the first group, Commission for International Justice and Accountability, uh, reflects the importance of Syrian witnesses and victims of core crimes in adopting the practices of the Office of International Prosecutor. For example, one of the, the key people that I interviewed was Chief Investigator One, a local Syrian from Dara who was a witness to the earlier crimes um, in the early days of the, of the Arab Spring, who adopted the practices of the officers of the International Prosecutor. And what I mean by that is that initially he, he came and uh, saw what he saw was what he, what he viewed as crimes um, and started to document it. But um, in the process of that, he also then buddied up with international uh, private non-state actors who had expertise in international criminal law, um, including international criminal tri tribunals, to understand and learn what was unique about international criminal prosecution as distinct from uh, civil law, which was his area. And with a group of journalists and criminal um, law experts, they began to train with this international uh, expert, uh, which was at that time, uh, William Wiley, whose background was the ICTY, ICC, amongst other areas, and also people like Stephen Rapp at that time, who was then the ambassador uh, for the US for crimes at large. And as they began to, to collect the material, the, the standard was really to, to the, the explanation, the training was centered around collecting material that um, linked senior leaders uh, to the underlying crimes um, and that was produced by the perpetrator. So it's much more difficult in court to say that they didn't they didn't write that note if, the, if they're signing in that note, for, ex for instance, you can't question it, it becomes a fact in the criminal prosecution. So as they began collecting that material, um, it was then that the, these particular Syrians, local Syrians, then started to ask if they could organise a uh, independent uh, group or commission to be established, and that's how it began. Over time, they've continued to be trained and they continue to collect documents. And at this stage, they've collected over a million documents. Um, and in doing that, it has to follow a chain of, um, a chain of custody. 
The second group, European Centre for Constitutional Human Rights, again follows a very similar model in the sense that it's victims and witnesses of core crimes who then link up with international knowledge. Again, the reason being that in the local um, in the local context, there's a failure for the local judiciary to pursue core crimes such as torture, and so they need to then pursue uh, the international channels and and, to, and in international crimes um, to be able to do that under universal jurisdiction. In this context, you have people like Mazen Darish, who was a victim and witness of core, core crimes, who then were linking up with people like Patrick Croker at the European Centre for Constitutional Human Rights. Um, both groups, the Commission for International Justice and Accountability and the European Centre for Constitutional Human Rights, both played a, a, an important role in contributing to the Syrian case in the German courts in the higher regional court of the region of Koblenz. And that's where I start to look at the role of the German universal jurisdiction. So this year, as you already know, um, the German courts were the first to prosecute and convict a member of the Syrian intelligence service, EIA, for crimes against humanity, specifically in aiding, abetting torture and aggravated deprivation of liberty. Um, the case of EIA, whilst has finished, there's a codependent Anwar R continues, and he's a much more senior uh, tertiary level, um, it, previously in the intelligence service, and that continues and should finish later today. Um, Anwar R and Iyad A were considered uh, really landmark cases and to be able to test uh, whether or not core crimes occurred, including torture and crimes against humanity. And what's really particular about um, this context, the German legal system is that in, in the pursuing the case, they had to be able to show that there was crimes against humanity. And that included in German law, showing a systematic and widespread um, crushing of the opposition. Um, that's, there's some, a few points there that I'd like to highlight in the German system that makes it unique and the broadest universal jurisdiction in the world. One is that the core crimes are listed in the German basic law in their institution, so they're clearly outlined um, and included, which includes crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide. They've also explicitly in integrated these crimes into the, the criminal code system, and the effect of which is that the German Federal Public Prosecutor General is obliged to investigate core crimes and to prosecute um, should he have the evidence or, sh or she have the evidence. Uh, what's also really unique is that they are not limited to those core crimes being perpetrated in Germany um, by Germans or that the victim needs to be uh, a German citizen. So that doesn't have to have any relationship to Germany whatsoever. So it's at the discretion of the, the federal prosecutor. Um, in the case of uh, Germany, um, an example of this is that they um, that there was a case the courts issued the extradition request against Jamil Hassan in 2018, uh, it then with the incumbent head of the Syrian armed forces. And uh, of course, in public international law, incumbent head of state is immune, but uh, and, and also the foreign minister, but obviously not the incumbent um, after that. Separate but related is that the German lands or states are obliged under German law to investigate and prosecute uh, those suspected of core crimes. Um, in the case of NYR and EAD A, um, this was the case. So they were in the German jurisdiction, they came through the migration and um, they were arrested by the, by the uh, federal police in the respective land. Um, as I said before, uh, both the private non-state actors, um, CJA and the, and the Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights played an important part in contributing. And members of the German Federal Public Prosecutor General have acknowledged that the, the role of private non-state actors, including witnesses and victims, in assisting in their inquiries, both in the Syrian case and other previous cases um, relating to core international crimes prosecuted in Germany. Um, I'm not sure if I have time just to quickly go over the lessons learned, but just jump in if, if I don't, if I've run out of time. So there's a number of lessons learned I would to uh, highlight here. I think the real difference in the Syrian case compared to other cases, for example, uh, the role of non state actors in previous cases, such as Juan Garces in the case of Pinochet, um, who was a witness of the very early crimes of Pinochet and then later collected material and submitted the private criminal complaint into the Madrid courts. And also uh, others such as Soleimani Guangguang, who was a victim of core crime in Chad, um, who was also one of the ones who collected the initial witness statements and also submitted the private criminal complaint in Senegal where Habre was residing at that time and later ended up with the, uh, the establishment of the, um, 
the extraordinary uh, African chambers was that in relation to Syria, this was a, a situation where the material collected that would in, later inform evidence um, was being collected whilst the crimes were occurring and as the crimes continue to occur. For example, uh, CJAR's material was um, requested and submitted into the German courts and uh, many of the witnesses were collected and identified and collected their statements whilst the crimes were occurring. Um, we also get to see some of the senior leaders starting to be prosecuted um, whilst the senior leader is still, the alleged senior leader of the crimes is still in power in the case of Pinochet and Habre, it was when they left that that process, all of these processes really started. Um, the second thing I would highlight is the role of uh, what I call cooperative criminal accountability communities. So these are communities of practice where witness and victims buddy up with knowledge, either um, international practitioners that are private non-state actors and or with state legal officials in a front court, for example, in the federal, um, federal process of, the, of Germany, or say, for example, in the case of Pinochet and the Madrid courts. So again, it really highlights the, the essential nature of the, of, and the complexity of putting a case together really requires a cooperative nature. That's not to say that Syrians need to agree. Um, they should really debate uh, just generally because they've not been able to do that under, their, uh, under the uh, Saad government. But when it comes to putting a prosecution and putting a strategy together, the, the, it highlights the importance of cooperative criminal accountability communities. The second thing I would say is that it highlights um, how actors conceptualize international criminal justice as distinct from some, maybe in the mainstream, you might see the International Criminal Court as the system of international criminal justice. And this say, it's a very decentralized way of thinking about it. And it really lends from HLA Hart's concept of law in that the system is international criminal law itself. And so that they then conduct uh, and identify sources of international law on a probationary basis, and then hope to have those um, informed officially in a future criminal prosecution. Um, the last thing I would say is, is to really highlight the role of the Convention Against Torture, um, the uniqueness of it, and I think Ibrahim will talk about this um, in, in, his, in his particular point, is that it's a very unique crime as a just Kogans of international law um, with erga omnis obligations, which means that it, uh, states have an obligation and there's a majority of the of world states are um, have are actually uh, state parties to it. You don't need to ratify it. Once you sign it, you must. Uh, put it into your legal system. So I think I'll stop there and let everybody else have a chance to speak. Thank you very much, Melinda, for this uh, wonderful first uh, input. Uh, we welcome now Ibrahim Olavi, who has joined us uh, despite being on paternity leave. So congratulations for recently uh, becoming a father and thank you very much for joining us. And the floor is yours, Ibrahim. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Julie. And uh, you know, this uh, my 15 minute delay exactly explains why one should not accept commitments while on paternity leave. So apologies for that, but I'm so glad to, to be here. And it's uh, it's something that I actually wanted and was excited to kind of speak to the community and, and, and with esteemed panelists about this, um, this topic. And the reason why, you know, part of why I think talking about accountability is, is so, so important in the Syrian context, is that we're talking 10 years on, you know, we Celebrated might be an, uh, an odd word for some, but uh, for many Syrians, it was a celebration of the upri of 10 years of the uprising, notwithstanding the amount of crimes that were committed. And the landscape has changed incredibly uh, for, for in the last 10 years, talking about uh, uh, accountability. Perhaps kind of a first reflection on when the word accountability was first used in the Syrian context. And in my opinion, it was used way too early on in what I think was a foreign policy strategy to try and deter crimes. So when you talk about accountability that we will hold perpetrators to account and you put pressure on that, the in one of actually foreign policy documents of a, of a, of a large Western state that I've, that I've had a look at very early on, it said the more we talk about accountability for crimes, the more that that should deter Assad and its allies. But it didn't. And because accountability is a more politically kind of acceptable term 
rather than doing something to prevent the crime in the first place that you're calling for accountability for, that foreign policy strategy in itself, in my opinion, proved failure when it comes to deterrence. A lot of states, and I'm sure when you speak to a lot of victims and a lot of families and, and, and you know, a lot of people who suffered in the Syrian conflict, they would have much rather to have the, the conversation around prevention in 2012, 2013, 2014, up to 2020, rather than let's hold perpetrators to account while the kind of atrocities are ongoing. But because of the political fear around what prevention might mean, if it includes a military option with the legacies of Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and all of that, it created the safe option for, uh, uh, for politicians to choose, something that was, in my opinion, would have been much better discussed now that the conflict has calmed down rather than uh, at the beginning. So that's the first observation that, that I have on, on, on the use of an accountability strategy in generally on, uh, in, in Syria coming from states. The second point is that there was a lot of investment in documentation, something that Melinda was just talking about. Very early on, a lot of funding went into documenting crimes, which I think is fantastic and, and, and was very kind of important. But in a, in, a, in, a, in a recent conversation that I had with a, with a former senior special rapporteur, UN special rapporteur, it was interesting that he raised a, a concept of a state that he was trying to get the Security Council to act upon it. And one Security Council diplomat said the numbers are too low. And he made the point that in Syria, the numbers are too high in order for the world to act. It became too complex. You've documented so much that the system no longer is able to cope with it properly. And therefore, we're seeing this delay of impunity or, or the fight against impunity and, and, and kind of an extension of impunity over a, a long period of time. It's now because you have hundreds of thousands of victims. You have hundreds of thousands of people who got killed, people detained, missing persons, all sorts of uh, uh, weapons and, and, and uh, in terms of gravity and in terms of uh, scale being committed in, in, uh, in Syria. And I think that was a tactic that the Syrian regime deployed from day one. Instead of trying to conceal your crimes, instead of trying to hide your crimes, overburden the system to an extent where it will no longer be able to operate and process the amount of crimes that are being committed. And instead, it will be framed as a war where all parties of a conflict have committed crime, where the casualties are so high that you're no longer able to distinguish between collateral damage, which is permissible, and targeted acts, uh, acts against civilians, which are not. And everything will be framed as a war. And then the refugees will return and everything will be fine. And there will be nothing to hold perpetrators to account. And I would say that that strategy, if it wasn't for Caesarian civil society organizations, victim groups and associations, and in their international allies, some of whom Melinda just mentioned, would have largely succeeded. It succeeded to a large extent because now we're seeing, you know, Syria is safe. The war is over. Return to Syria. We're seeing all those talk. Instead of talking about justice, instead of talking about accountability, at least in the international fora, as much as attention as accountability should deserve, we're seeing, you know, the all parties to the conflict have committed crime, crimes, which that sentence might sound, you know, an objective sentence, a useful sentence, a very kind of accurate sentence. But it is, it is that sentence that helps perpetrators get away with their crimes, because the moment all parties have committed crimes and the moment you've got five official armies on Syria's land, not, to, not calling about non-state actors or, uh, or, or others, militias on, 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 on different sides, it is difficult to hold all parties to account. And if you do focus on one actor, and something that I will get to in a moment when I talk about the ICJ case, because it was focused on the Syrian state as a, as a whole, you get the cause of, un, uh, of being biased, of selective justice, of politicizing justice, and so on, because the scene of documentation became so overly kind of uh, uh, complicated. So that, that, that's the second point that, that I'll make, that, that this excessive documentation, in a way, was very useful but it had risks that need to be better mitigated of not knowing where to start. And this was something that, for example, the international and independent mechanism that was established by the General Assembly in Syria to work towards accountability had to deal with at the beginning is where do we start? Which crime? Which area? Which time period? Which is always a very difficult challenge uh, uh, to start when you're trying to get towards uh, uh, accountability. 
Now, it is also important, that would be my third point, that to frame accountability much wider than criminal and judicial accountability. Because in my opinion, the Syrian government and the Assad regime being the primary uh, perpetrators of uh, the, the crimes in Syria, do not necessarily see accountability in the same te textbook uh, kind of uh, approach that some of us may do and focusing it only on courts. So if we talk, talk about accountability in a way that is some sort of a consequence that annoys, that hurts, that holds to kind of account the perpetrator who's committing those crimes, we find ourselves in the Syrian context going far beyond just judicial stuff. So let us look quickly at what the Syrian state cares about and how one could hold them to account to, uh, in, in, in that field. First and foremost, and that's something that a lot of Syrians will, 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 will remember in, in Syria, when you used to get stopped at a checkpoint and you argue with a security officer, you get slapped and saying, we are the state. We, we are the state. And this idea of the state is something that we see the Syrian regime actively fighting for the legitimacy of the state, being the representative of Syria and the international forums, far more than other rogue states that one might try to compare the Assad regime to. So now I'm, I'm sure you've seen last week or two weeks ago, they've been elected to the WHO uh, uh, Executive Committee. They, they, they're they part of decolonization UN committees. They attend every Human Rights Council session, every General Assembly, every Security Council session. And so they constantly want to be seen as the state. And once you're able to use the documentation efforts and the UN efforts and, and the reporting and, and the kind of uh, uh, naming and shaming to kind of reduce that legitimacy of the state, that is something that would drive the Syrian regime mad. And criminal accountability is part of that because it's obviously it's something that is linked to it. But, it, but it's not something that on its own, in my opinion, would hold the state apparatus, the complex system to account. Then you have the economic interests and that, and, and, and you've, you've seen that if, if we just look at the importance of these two things from the perspective of the state. So the state wants legitimacy, you can fight it and hold it to account through that. And you can also see the economic rhetoric around sanction that the regime is leading in order to try and benefit the warlords that invested money into this war and the states like Russia and Iran that financially invested. And the moment you're able to stop that, again, criminal accountability being one way of it because it sends them message that this country is full of war criminals, but other economic and political measures that prevent that kind of financial flow into the hands of the Assad regime is also a form of accountability. So these two things are kind of strong, non-criminal, non-judicial ways that seem to be working and really annoying the state. The third, which is sometimes downplayed, is having people like Noura, people like Amna, people who have, as Melinda said, not have the chance to speak against the regime, sitting in the Human Rights Council, across the table, in the Security Council, from the uh, Assad representative, and be able to speak their truth about what happened to them. For a group, a party, a state, a regime, an apparatus that has been working so hard to, to, you know, to shut people up and be able to kind of control them, giving victims, giving survivors, giving those people a voice is a form that again, drives the Syrian regime absolutely bonkers because they've been working 40 years to be able to silence them. So in my opinion, all these efforts and the criminal accountability that supports it and, and is actually a vehicle to do all of these things have uh, have have a huge impact on being uh, on the fight against impunity beyond just the criminal and judicial matters. Now, perhaps two quick reflections before be, before I end. One was on the Koblenz trials that Melinda mentioned. I think the, the the issue here is quite important to talk about the civil society perspective around and the debates that civil society have had about witnesses, about groups, uh, about the, the 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 importance. Is it symbolic? Is it really accountability? Is it not? Is such a healthy debate for Syrians to have because you know this is not something that we've been able to do, and this is was the first kind of experience that Syrians uh, uh, have had to to have such a discussion, which is an incredible uh, opportunity and it generated a lot of debates that I'm happy to go into in the questions and, and, and answer time. Um, and that, that is not to be belittled, that importance of civil society discussing these, th these matters, which also occurred 
when the International Court of Justice, uh, when the Netherlands decided to take action against Syria that could up, uh, end up in the International Court of Justice, there was also a very healthy debate about, but this is not criminal accountability. This is going using a, a treaty. Isn't that legitimizing the Syrian state? Isn't that and because there is a requirement to negotiate and arbitrate uh, and send a diplomatic note, something that ne the Netherlands did not have for years with, uh, with Syria? Isn't that part of the legitimization, the normalization process? And that debate around the ICJ case, in my opinion, as legal counsel, I'm part of the legal team with for the Netherlands on this case, has been uh, fascinating to really see uh, uh, the amount of debate that uh, of Syrian civil society and it was so healthy, notwithstanding the fact that you know I was severely criticized for working on this case and you know how on earth would you negotiate the regime on these on 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 on, on these matters, it was still a very useful alternative and complementary avenue to criminal accountability. So just to sum up, it's important to look at accountability in terms of the actors that promote it. And that also includes victim associations and groups that are able to speak up. And it's important to look at it beyond the criminal lens from the lens of the perpetrator about what matters to them in order to not see as you know that 10 years we've only been able to achieve one or two historic kind of cases in, in Germany and an arrest warrant in, in France, but to actually see that we have succeeded in the fight uh, or, or, or in, in the fight against impunity and impunity not succeeding from year one, year two, year three. If it wasn't for the efforts of private actors, international allies, Syrian groups, we would not have been having this conversation 10 years on while accountability is still on the table. The conflict would have ended very early on. People would have died. We would never he hear about them. And you know, the uh, the winner of, of of battles usually are the ones who, who write the history. So just on this message of hope, that I am hopeful that since day one we have been achieving accountability, and we will soon be able to even build upon that and reach far more important achievements. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for an interesting intervention there. Um, we're going to go to Nora and just a reminder to the audience that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat so I can collate them. So Nora, take it from us. Uh, thank you, Yuna. Um, thank you everyone for having me and congratulations, Ibrahim, for the new baby. Um, actually, I don't have much to speak after uh, Melinda and Ibrahim, like almost covers all, all cover all the points, but um, I just want to, to like to speak from a kind of different perspective as I'm based between Istanbul and Beirut. So my NGO works directly with the grassroots. Well, they, those people who are mostly families of enforced disappeared and uh, arbitrary detentions, uh, detainees, and also like most of those family are forcibly displaced from Syria. They, they have been living under siege and, uh, and bombing all the time. So they faced all the kind of violations against the human rights. And most of those uh, people we, we work with are, are women. So it's different when it comes to the ground when you work with people who are not activists actually who people maybe who like didn't decide their opinion if they are with or um, agree or disagree with the Syrian regime or all the parties people who, who were just affected by by the conflict in in Syria and basically we like all the time, I feel sometimes that we have to remind that, that, okay, there are a lot of parties in Syria, but are responsible on most of the crimes in Syria is the Syrian regime. And also the responsible of all these parties who were created after the conflict is the Syrian regime as well. So we all know that the Syrian conflict becomes more complicated day by day and there is a complete absence of any political solution, unfortunately. Syrians now are in a position of anger with the regime, with the opposition, uh, and above all of this, with the international community. This situation put the either the entire burden on the NGOs, whether local or international, uh, the, like the Syrian also are angry with them. Unfortunately, Syrians now have lost their trust and belief in almost everyone. And despite all of these, and besides the obstacles of any specialist INGOs to go inside Syria and collect evidence and testimonies under the permission, 
of the authorities there and other parties as well. The role played by these NGOs and INGOs is very essential. Uh, they lead the, all the process of documentation and accountability. I do believe uh, that justice is something unreachable most of the time. I'm saying this as a person, not as a lawyer, because it's it's different to me when I'm talk when I talk about justice as person or as lawyer. It's like this kind of conflict between my personal and professional life. Because as person, justice to me is to live with my husband and have kids and enjoy being a mom. Justice for me is to be able to go to Damascus and live there with my family. Uh, justice to me is to be treated as a normal person anywhere and not to face all this complication just because I'm Syrian. But as a lawyer, justice is to get all the criminals to the courts for sure and return to the right to Syrians. But I still have this conflict inside my heart as the court will not bring Basel again will not return 10 years of my life. Like each day brings more suffering for us and creates new needs, which put us in a place to find out new kind of justice, but nothing will achieve any peace or justice without a political transition. And there is no any kind of horizon that it will be a kind of transition in, in Syria. Be because basically there is, I don't find any international political willingness to do so. So personally, I'm so frustrated to the extension that I believe the regime will stay in the power forever, especially after the election. Well, the, the, like, the essential role of all these efforts of accountability is for sure for like the people in diaspora. And maybe it's the only role as people inside Syria or in the neighboring countries have nothing to do in the process of accountability because of the circumstances they live among. They are not safe. They have different needs and different priorities. Well, most of these mechanisms are like uh, target the crimes of torture, ill treatment, summary execution, and also most of them are against the regime, uh, which I mentioned that is responsible about most of the crimes anyway, and most of the, like, let's say, uh, the transform to the conflict to be an armed conflict. But it's not enough, in my opinion, as Ibrahim mentioned it some way, it's not acceptable to just watch the criminals committing crimes all the time and keep silent and refer some criminals to courts from time to time under many mechanisms. It's very important and I admit this, but I couldn't stop feeling that this is a kind of reward to Syrians as a reparation of the failure to reach any fair solution. And until now, the regime is not affected at all about everything happening. Besides, this kind of justice doesn't address the needs of majority of Syrians. It might address the demands of Syrians in Europe, but inside Syria and in the neighboring countries, the situation is totally different in a way that makes people not interested or even do not know what is happening. We should find a way to engage people there in this mechanism and to take into consideration their needs and demands. So we should fill this gap between Syrians. The suffering resulted of enforced disappearance is very complicated and has many different angles, economical, legal, uh, administrative, uh, all these kind of angles. So this creates more needs for those families, especially those who are most women and they are responsible now on their family uh, after the, the disappearance of their, of their men. So sometimes they, they don't also have this luxury to just suffer from the uncertainty and the missing of their beloved ones. They have like different, different responsibilities. And sometimes when we, we tell those families that, okay, you have to, to, to take your role in leading this file, you have to be engaged in all this process. They, they said that, okay, it's 10 years now and nothing uh, has been achieved and um, like our needs are decreasing day by day and 
all this mechanism will not like feed our kids, we're not pay the rent of our place or tent. Uh, so they feel this kind of frustrate, frustrate all the time. And I think, like Brahim mentioned, it's very important to engage those victims and survivors in this mechanism. But to be able to do so, we have to look up at their priorities and needs. You have to fulfill their needs and then to like to, to empower and enable them to take their, their main roles. Because like in, in most of the conflict and experience in the world, the victims have the like the leadership in, in all these files, especially the file of missing persons and enforced disappearance. Well, this different, uh, different uh, difference between priorities in, in the Syrian context put us in a situation that, okay, we have to go to, to the low way. We have to, uh, like, sometimes to follow up the, the, the existing mechanism and also to create a new mechanism because in the Syrian conflict, conflict there is no any kind of, um, like, way that it will be referred to ICC, ICC. the conflict is still go on, the crimes is still go on. So sometimes it, it's useless to talk about accountability without talking about the prevention. There is no accountability while, while the crimes is, go, or is going on all the time. Like we are talking now and there is a crime committed by, by the Syrian regime and others. So we, we have to focus on prevention and also, it's, it doesn't make sense to talk about transitional justice while it is no any kind of transition in Syria. Um, it's, it's a unique, it has its own characteristics, so we need to find and to engage all the point of view by, by Syrian themselves in finding a way to solve, to solve this, at least like temporary. Now we have to, to find something to, to like to limit these crimes against Syrians inside Syria and the difficulty they face, especially in the neighboring countries and the danger that they will be deported to Syria anytime. And we know now what's, what happened in, in Denmark. I don't want to take so much for the question. I know the time is running out, so I, I hope all is well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora, for such an interesting intervention there. I think. Um, we have one question that was asked in the chat. Just as a note, because we had the opening statements as part of the roundtable, we're going to go over a little bit uh, past one just to address the questions that are that are there. Um, but Sol Iglesias asked, "What has your experience been with the prosecution versus peace negotiation? Does the Syrian experience support the argument that prosecution doesn't preclude cooperation of leadership in the peace process?" or actually does it raise the stakes for potential spoilers to peace um, in this context? I think we actually touched upon this theme in different oblique ways in both Nora Abraham's comments as well as Melinda's comments earlier as to how we kind of think about the uh, uh, accountability in the broader context of Syria lacking a transition, but also in the, in the ongoing conflict and violations. Um, Ibrahim, if you wanna kind of take a first stab at the question and then whoever else wants to jump in, please feel free to do so. Sure. Th thank you very much. And I think that this question is so important and something that we actually faced a number of times when we were participating in the Geneva process. Uh, I got I had to deal with this question directly on a request of, uh, of staff members of the UN Special Envoy and, and so on. Well, to start with, you know, as um, as the saying goes, you kill one person, you might end up in prison, you kill 100,000, you end the peace conference in Geneva, right? And and, and that's one way for you to, to, to guarantee that you're sitting at, at the tables to be able to you know, destroy so much that no one can go after you in that sense. So for me, it's a question of strategy and it's a question of different actors. So, uh, and it's a question of specialism. So because it, it is, it starts from the kind of a, a, the premise that there are, there is not one actor on in, in the table or in the room. So those who are working on human rights and accountability should continue to do so because that creates leverage, creates deterrence, creates something for those who do not talk about justice and accountability to be able to put on the table, to be able to discuss, to be able to exclude people from the table that they don't want, that otherwise they would not have been able to do if not for the kind of pressure on accountability and so on. So there are members of the Constitutional Committee at the moment in Syria that have allegations of war crimes against them, that a lot of people in the, in, within the kind of 
a wider constitutional committee and other political processes don't want them to be there, but there's not enough leverage to, 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 to come at them from that, uh, uh, from that perspective. So definitely accountability actors, human rights actors, human rights defenders should not have to deal with this issue. They continue the work. Those who deal with policy and, uh, and peace should be able to build upon their work on accountability and say, listen, you cannot be on the table because of X, Y, and Z. And, and particularly in Syria, because you're not talking about two, one actor, it's such a chaos. And for me, chaos actually breeds opportunity. You're able to kind of deal with different actors, be able to convince one actor against the other and, and so on. And definitely those cases, th those accountability kind of uh, um, efforts creates the leverage in order for you to be able to negotiate peace with more sensible actors. You know, I can't deal with you. I can deal with your subordinate who might not have directly committed crimes or does not have the level of complex, uh, complicity in the crime as the, uh, uh, as the person in charge. But yeah, definitely a question that should not be dealt with by one person, each to their own, each to their specialism. And it's a matter of, of kind of strategic uh, planning and what to say, when, to whom, uh, rather than just a kind of a one, one whole approach. Melinda Norwich, anyone wants to jump in or add on to that? Um, I, I don't want to add uh, after Brahim talked, but um, I, I just jump in uh, to this idea of Astana negotiation. Um, personally, I'm not satisfied about all the process in Astana, but it's reality now and we feel like we are not satisfied at all that we are as Syrians are excluded of all this process in Astana well, while they are bring experts from, from every place. They are like the main, uh, let's say, responsible uh, states are, are there. So um, it's it's also something very bad to, to be done. And also, um, the other idea is just because like this accountability uh, and this kind of justice are have a very like let's say political background and needs a kind of political resolution so we can focus on other kind of uh, which which reform already uh, or shape the uh, transitional justice which is redress and reparation so it's not this kind of, of justice uh, doesn't need a kind of political resolution, for example. So, but it's needed for 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 a lot of Syrians action. Thank you. Mila, did you want to jump in? We have one more question. Um, depending on whether you wanted to jump in on this question first. No, that's okay. I'll, we should let let the other person have their question. Thank you. <laughs> So the question social asked, isn't the problem of access, isn't there a problem of accessing uh, people? I mean, I'm understanding this as both victims and, and witnesses who suffer under the Syrian regime, etc. Isn't that part of the main problem of documentation? I think this was kind of addressed in part with Melinda's um, statement earlier of how she explained how this documentation is done as partnership between local actors as well as international um, NGOs. But if anyone else wants to elaborate further on this question or problem of actually accessing witnesses, victims in the country. I didn't get the question. I'm trying to read it, but I didn't get the point of the question, actually. Uh, it's asking about the problem to access people uh it's like sometimes it's a problem to access people from everywhere because like the other parties under like let's say the turkish uh existence for example or courts are not much better than the, uh, the control area by the syrian regime but there's always ways to to access people actually and to get them to to get their testimonies for for ngos or for for media as well uh, it's also even for us uh, as NGOs, because for example, we work in Lebanon, we are based in, in Beirut, so we cannot talk uh, about anything happened by the Lebanese government. It's for our safety and for the team safety. I'm based now in Istanbul, I'm registered in, in Turkey and I will start work in Turkey. So I keep silent about everything happened by, the, by Turkish. And this is also very hectic for us to just keep silent because we are always under the 
like in Lebanon, under the, the risk of being deported, or uh, in Turkey, maybe will be under the risk of being arrested as well. So it's another kind of application, complication that Syrians face every, every day. But there have always been ways to do any, anything. Melinda, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just um, say, say something briefly about that, um, just to follow on from your, because I think that's a really good point, is in the case, I can speak to the case of the, of the German case against Ziad A and Anwar Up, um, is that uh, in the case of Sijar, the point is that they act and continue to be anonymous. And so that's actually why I refer to him as uh, Chief Investigator One. And um, the importance of keeping being anonymous or remaining anonymous and acting as private non-state actors and collecting the material has actually been what has been able, means that they can access all of that material. And just to explain is that they have to follow a chain of custody, which means in part of that is that they have to box up the whole entire office when they, and then negotiated um, during when opposition seized a, a town, for instance, they would have to box up the whole entire contents of the office, say military intelligence, they can't pick and choose, they have to box it all up and then write a note as to where they, who's track, who's using it, who's taking it and how it's traveling outside the country. So there's that aspect of it. So in that sense, the, the million documents or so, and some of which were uh, submitted to the German um, trial were following in that sense a, a Nuremberg model, which is produced by the perpetrator. And it, what it shows is the command coming down the, the chain of command and then saying, yes, we accomplished what you asked us to do. And it goes back up to say the Ministry of Justice to say we carried out that order. And that's what you need to show um, in terms of large scale, um, uh, widespread uh, systematic um, you know, suppression of the opposition, which is what was also required in the San Habre case, uh, where the Human Rights Watch um, individuals that were working with Soleimani Grand Grand came across the secret um, intelligence abandoned building where there was just material everywhere, and that's what they accessed. Um, the second thing I'll say is the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights were really amazing in budding up with other uh, witnesses and victims um, in identifying witnesses and that was really key including insider witnesses and as you probably know that there is quite a sizable amount of um, of people from Syria that have migrated outside of Syria into Europe and so therefore can be accessed but also including people that have resided in um, other countries such as uh, Turkey and a part of what the government in German government has had to do is take on that responsibility of ensuring that they are protected when they are traveling to Germany for the case and whilst that they're in Germany they are they protected. The last thing I'll add is that they did have um, issues in the German case where they uh, needed to to that some witnesses needed to remain anonymous um, because they were concerned about their life so there was an extraordinary effort around trying to protect them. Uh, Ibrahim, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, just building briefly on what Melinda has been saying, the, the, the key thing is that you have a million Syrians in Europe and the West. And, and you know, if 1% of these, and all, all, many of were kind of witnesses to horrific, horrific crimes. And so if you have 1% of these who are willing to go and, you know, give their witness statements, be part of complaints, then you are able to control the narrative. You are able to kind of push accountability quite hard. So you don't really need access that much to people in Syria anymore when you're talking about the grave crimes, because a lot of them have sought refuge in Europe. They're right by the by the doorstep. Yes, there are fears. They have they have legitimate fears related to their family back home, issues of asylum, misconceptions that if they do speak out they might lose their, their their refugee status things like that that you know has to be dealt with the issues of witness protection and so on but the witness is right there the victim is right there it's it's no longer a matter of me having to sneak people out or sneak myself in in, in that sense i think that's all very interesting i mean i guess here we're seeing sort of different layers of difficulties that come with these um quote-unquote kind of private efforts of documentation right going back to nora and melinda's statement is that there is added burden on the people who are kind of uh, spearheading the documentation as well on top of the kind of basic kind of difficulty of establishing a chain of command when you're dealing with an ongoing conflict situation but as ibrahim pointed out the landscape also has changed with the conflict so there is sort of added sort of uh, both complexity and simplification of the, of, the, of the issue that we need to be 
taking on board. Um, we are officially, I believe, out of time, um, even including our time with the introduction. So thank you so much for our wonderful panelists today for taking the time for your great um, interventions. Really lots to think about. Um, my understanding is that at least part of this will be available online on recording. We will be obviously um, advertising that and being in touch about how you can access the recording. But thank you again and hope everybody has a wonderful conference and stay engaged on these issues.